אוקיי. אוקיי, good afternoon. Today we will speak about uh, Android. So the first question, how many of you are planning to or have already started to develop an Android application for the project? Okay, so I hope these lessons, these three lessons will be useful for you, but also for everybody else, because I think that Android is a quite interesting topic. So, this is only a quick introduction to Android. The sli some slides and figures are taken from the mobile application development course, that is a um, course in the second year of the master degree program. And uh, this is only a quick introduction, so we don't have time to cover all the specific details of Android. If you need more information, you can use the online documentation that is available at this link. So here you can find many different examples and information about Android. And, uh, but I think that uh, with this introduction, we will be able to develop uh, uh, simple web applications, uh, sorry, mobile applications. So this is the summary of our first uh, lesson. We will start briefly with uh, the history of Android and then we will see the platform and the characteristics of the Android platform. Then we will move to Android applications, fundamentals, life cycles, and finally we will see how we can use development tools to create uh, mobile applications. So let's start with Android history. Um, Android was originally created by Andy Rubin and the goal, the first goal of the company was to develop uh, an operating system for digital cameras. But then the goal changed uh, towards a more generic operating system for uh, mobile devices to compete with wi Windows Mobile and Symbian. Android was then acquired by Google in 2005 and now is maintained by the Open Onset Alliance. That is an uh, organization of, I think, 84 companies and uh, where Google is the leader. So nowadays uh, Android is one of the most common mobile operating system and is run over millions of mobile devices and each month almost 2 billion people uh, download uh, applications and games from the Google Play Store. And since 2007, many different Android versions have been released and um, the current one is the 8.1. Unfortunately, Android 8 introduced some big changes, especially for the background parts. But as you can see in the figure, the majority of devices still continue to run an uh, earlier version of Android. So if you want to uh, develop a mobile application now, you should try to maintain compatibility with the older versions. Okay, now let's look at the Android platform. And here the name platform is very important because Android is not only an operating system, but it's an open source software stack for a wide range of mobile devices and a corresponding open source project led by Google. This is the definition of Android. So there is the operating systems, but there are also tools for creating apps and games. Okay. And another important thing about Android is that development tools are free, so you can uh, download them and start developing applications. And typically, Android applications are written in Java, okay? So there is also support for C++ and Kotlin, but the most common way of developing Android applications is Java. So how many of you know how to program in Java? Okay, so if you don't know Java, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time to cover also the Java, the Java language. So you have to use the online documentation to self-learn Java, let's say. Okay, and um, 
there is uh, differently from other um, ecosystems such as iOS. Um, in Android, there is no distinction between native and third-party applications. So let's say everything is pluggable and customizable. And um, so all the applications use the same the software development kit and all the applications can access the underlying hardware. But for accessing the hardware, you need the user permission. So do you want to take a photo from your application? You must ask the user uh, the permission to use the camera. Uh, you would like to, I don't know, send uh, emails from your uh, application? You must ask the permission to the user. Okay? So when you install an application uh, on your phone, you typically receive uh, a message uh, this application would like to use uh, the camera. This application would like to send messages. Do you agree? If you say yes, the application is installed. If you say no, the application is not installed. Okay? So just a few words about Java. Java is a general purpose computer language and that is concurrent, class-based, object-oriented and uh, portable. So the portability is one of uh, the main important uh, points of Java. And uh, this means that um, uh, programs written in Java should run uh, similarly on any different combinations of hardware and operating system. And to achieve this goal, the Java code is um, compiled into an intermediate representation named bytecode. And then this bytecode is run uh, on a virtual machine that is written specifically for, uh, for a given hardware. Okay, we have seen the main characteristics of the Android uh, platform. Now let's look at the Android uh, architecture, okay? So Android is an innovative operating system and it's actually a stack of uh, software components. And so beside the operating system, um, and the tools for creating apps, the development tools. Android uh, provides you also a set of minimal uh, applications, such as a browser, the email client, that you can reuse from other applications. So this is an important thing, we will see this later on. Uh, all components in Android can be reused. So, uh, if you need to open a web page, for example, from your application, you don't have to develop uh, your browser. You can simply say, okay, Android, uh, can you open this web page? And Android will open the default browser that is typically Chrome, okay? And Android has been designed to be robust, so it's based on the Linux operating system kernel. And for security purposes, uh, each Android application runs in a separate process and in each process there is uh, an instance of a virtual machine that actually executes the code. And this figure uh, shows the overall architecture of uh, Android. So we will see briefly each block of this figure. The first block is the kernel. So it's based on the Linux kernel, so it, Android takes advantage of the Linux kernel uh, security features and allows device manufacturers to develop hardware drivers for a well-known kernel. And in the kernel, you have all the functionality that typically a kernel performs. So you have memory management, network management, inter-process communication, and so on. Then we have the hardware abstraction layer that is used to isolate the hardware um, of your smartphone uh, so that you don't get crazy about dealing with specific hardware details. So it offers a set of libraries to be used by the upper layers and designed specifically for a given type of hardware. Then we have the Android application runtime block. Um, that is used to execute the virtual machines to execute uh, the Android application. So Android don't use the standard Java virtual machine, but it uses a custom one named Art. Um, and so again, it's, this block is used to run multiple virtual machines 
one for each running applications. Then we have some C, C++ libraries that are used to offer high-level functionalities to the upper layers. So we have some libraries to uh, record uh, audio and play video. We have the SQLite libraries and so on. Then we have the Java Software Deve Development Kit that offers a set of Java, Java APIs to be used to develop Android applications. And finally, we have the system application layer that includes all the system and user applications of your phone. Okay, so as I already told you, for security purposes, each application runs in a separate process and each application runs with its own user. So once the application is installed, the operating system creates a new user profile associated with it and the system ensures that one user cannot alter or read another user's file. And this is also important, we will see later on this concept. Um, to be installed, an application must contain a special XML file that is called manifest. So the manifest is a sort of contract uh, between um, the application and the operating system and it should include all the components of an application and all the required permissions, okay? So if you try to use from your code, uh, I don't know, uh, an hardware component for which you don't have the, the user permission or you don't have um, described the permission in the manifest file, you will simply receive an exception. Okay, and uh, yeah, beside the hardware, you can also ask the permission to access uh, sensitive data, such as user preferences, location, contacts, and so on. Okay, we have seen the platform, the architecture of the platform, and now let's look at the single applications. So just to recap, in order to develop an Android application, you need to install the Android Software Development Kit that exposes a set of Java, Java APIs which allows the access to the underlying hardware. So the points to remember are that there is no distinction between native and third-party applications. Uh, each application um, should uh, ask the user the permission for access sensitive hardware and data, and you can reuse uh, uh, application components in Android. And the main programming language is Java. Okay, so typically an application consists of a set of data and code that together perform some operation and offer some functionality to the user. However, the, there are big differences between standard applications and uh, uh, Android applications. So typically standard applications have an entry point, so a main function from which you start creating uh, variables, you start making HTTP requests and so on. Android applications do have a main, let's say an entry point, but you don't have to write it, it's already written. And uh, the, um, the basic task of this main is simply to manage the life cycle of components. That's because um, actually an Android application is a set of components that are managed by the operating system, okay? And it's the operating system that manages such components and not you. So you cannot directly, explicitly create a component <laughs> you must ask Android to do that, okay? We will see this later on. So you can get informed of what, what's happening, but you cannot create uh, explicitly components. So, what is a component? It's actually a Java class that has a specific life cycle managed by Android, and uh, Android informs each component about its life cycle. So this is, the, I think, the most important pattern to develop in Android. So you have some components that are Java classes, 
and Android generates some events and from the Java code you can uh, react to such events and perform uh, some operations. So, for example, Android can tell you, okay, I'm going to kill this component. And if you, in the Java class, you uh, register a specific callback, you can perform some operations before the killing process. And uh, these are the four main components. We have activities, services, content providers, and broadcast receivers. Obviously, you can use all of them or a subset of them. And now we will see briefly each component. So the first component, maybe the most important for us, uh, are activities. So activities um, are components designed for supporting user interaction. So activities do have a user, a user interface and they represent a window, a screen of our application. And each activity is designed to support a single specific user task. Okay, so for example, in an email client, we will have uh, an activity to list the new emails, another activity to compose an email, another one to read, to read emails, and so on. Okay, so each activity corresponds to a well-defined user task. And um, again, you can reuse activities of other applications from uh, your code. So if you need to send an email, you can simply ask Android to, okay, I have to send an email. And Android will reply to you uh, by opening the default activity for sending uh, an email that typically it's uh, the one of Gmail and so on. Okay, this is extremely powerful because you don't have to write code that already exists and user experience uh, well-defined user interfaces, such as the one of Gmail. Okay, then we have services. Services are used to run long operations in the background. So services don't have any user interfaces and uh, they are typically used to, for example, download things from the web uh, or to play music in your application without blocking the user interaction with, with uh, the app. Then we have content providers. Mm, I think we will not use this component in our applications, but just for information, content providers are used to share data between applications uh, in a structured way. So for example, you can ask, uh, I don't know, the music app of your phone to give you the list of songs saved on your phone, or you can ask the contact applications to give you the list uh, of contacts saved on your phone. And finally, we have broadcast receivers uh, that are components we, which are executed whenever some registered events happen. So um, each broadcast receiver is associated with one or more system or user events and are executed when such events happen. So you may have a broadcast receiver to uh, be executed when your phone starts up or when you, I don't know, enable the Wi-Fi of your phone or when you receive a, a message and so on. Okay, so the life cycle of a broadcast receiver is really short. Uh, when the monitored event happens, the broadcast receiver is instantiated and executed and then it, Im it is immediately destroyed. Okay, so also broadcast receivers don't have any user interfaces, but they can generate notifications in the status bar. Okay, so this figure summarizes the structure of an Android application. <coughs> we have activities that support user interaction, and when the activity receives the user input, they, they can, uh, it can perform uh, different operations, such as accessing files, databases, and so on. Then we have services to perform uh, background operations and we have content providers to share data with other applications and we have broadcast receiver to react to system end users events. Okay? Okay. So, 
we have seen the platform, the architecture of the platform, and uh, some concepts about uh, uh, Android applications. So now let's look at the application lifecycle, that is the pro process that goes from the user tapping the application icon to the execution of, of, uh, of the application. So as I already told you, when we create an application, we can create as many components as we want, and we provide a manifest file that lists all these components and the required permissions. And um, so to be instantiated, uh, a component must be declared in the manifest file. And when the user tap the application icon on the phone, Android creates a new process, okay? And inside the process, it instantiates the uh, virtual machine to execute the application. And for each application, Android, uh, the first team thing is that Android instantiates uh, a special single object named application. That is, let's say, the main of our, of our application. And this object is simply used to manage all the other objects. So it manages the life cycle of the other application objects. And, um, okay. and also the application object can, can react to some uh, system events. So if the application object that is a Java class uh, instantiate the onCreate method, it can react to the event uh, that Android generates when the application is started, okay? So this component, this uh, object component, uh, um, will be executed before any other components and it will be destroyed after all the other components have been destroyed. Okay, so typically we don't have to modify this application object and uh, when the application object has been created, Android instantiates the main activity, okay? This is not the, the entry point, it's simply the activity, the, the first activity that you would like to open when you tap the application, uh, the application icon, okay? Obviously, the activity is a Java class and it can react to some events. <coughs> Uh, such as on create, on start, on resume. These three methods are, are called at the beginning uh, and they, means, they mean that the application is now ready for, um, uh, for interaction with the user. Okay, the application will remain, let's say, in this interactive state until some events happen, such as I receive a new email, I receive a new WhatsApp, message, okay? If I receive, for example, a, a WhatsApp message, uh, the application is paused. Maybe it's still visible, but it's no more interactive, okay? And then if I open the WhatsApp uh, application, my application is stopped, okay? Then if I come back to my application, the application is resumed, okay? So this is the life cycle, the entire life cycle of, a, of uh, an application, of an activity, sorry. And um, you should design your application, keeping in mind that your application can be paused, stopped, and then resumed, okay? So you should save, let's say, temporary data. Uh, so for example, I'm writing uh, a message on my application and then I receive a WhatsApp message. I open the WhatsApp uh, application, uh, I reply to the message and then I come back to my application. I should uh, design my application to restore the message I was writing before, okay? So this is the, the key point. Okay. The last theoretical concept for today, then we will move to develop the first example. Uh, and this point are intents. 
So to instantiate components, such as executing an activity or a service or a broadcast receiver, Android uses special messages called intents. So for example, when you tap the icon of your application, Android generates an intent. Uh, that means, okay, now I have to execute the main activity of this app, okay? And we can also generate intents uh, from our code, so for example, for executing a specific uh, activity or a specific service. I cannot say, I don't know, my activity equals new activity, my activity dot run. No, I can only say, okay, Android, I would like to open this activity. Can you do that? Okay, so an intent defines an action to be performed and a set of data uh, on which to operate. And intents can be implicit or explicit, okay? Uh, so the difference is that when uh, with explicit intents, we can refer to specific components. So I want to open the activi my activity for the login phase or I want to use the service I developed for monitoring my Wi-Fi connection, okay? With implicit feedback, instead, we only specify the type of the action we are interested in, and Android will select one or more components to execute this action, okay? So, more in detail, an implicit intent consists of three main parts. We have the action, that is an, a unique string describing what is requested, the data, that typically is a URI, and the category, one or more strings, that contains additional optional information. So, for example, I can have an, in, an implicit intent where the action is equal to view, for example, and the data is equal to uh, a web page, okay? I send this intent to Android, and Android will open uh, one or more browser, uh, installed in the phone, okay? So, as we already seen, all the components are stored in the, mani are declared in the manifest file and for each component we can specify one or more intent filters that, um, that means, okay, I am, I am a component and I will react to these intents, okay? So, for example, uh, uh, if we have uh, two different components of two different applications um, associated with the same intent filter, when we generate an implicit intent and we send it to Android, Android will ask us, okay, which application would you use? And we can select which application to be used for this operation. Okay, this is an example of a simple manifest file and this is an application with only one component, an activity, okay? And this is the intent filter that is used to specify that this activity is the main activity. So the activity that will be opened when the user tap the application icon, okay? And this is the intent filter. And finally, we have uh, explicit intents. Uh, so an explicit intent in, is one that you use to launch a specific app component, such as a particular activity or a service. And obviously, you can create and send explicit intents from your code. We will see the syntax in our examples. Typically, you have to specify the context of your app and the Java class of the component you are interested in. Okay, good. So, let's say more about developing, developing tools. The most convenient way of developing Android applications is to use Android Studio, that is an integrated uh, development environment, IDE, which you can download for, um, from this URL. 
okay it's a big file so you must be sure you have enough space on your PC you can also develop uh, Android applications with Eclipse but the most common way is to use Android Studio and uh, Android Studio in Android Studio we can find a rich code editor a lot of code templates and many tools for integrating your code uh, with GitHub you have the possibility to use emulators uh, to view preview of your activities and um, Android Studio um, automatically manages the third-party li libraries with Gradle. Gradle mm -hmm. is a software um, in which you can specify, let's say, the name of uh, a library you want to use, and Gradle automatically downloads it. Uh, so in Python, you have to install a new module to use a, a custom library, let's say. Here, we use Gradle. You see? Okay, and um, by installing Android Studio, you also install the Android SDK. Okay, good. And Android SDK consists of a set of Java APIs and a set of tools to develop and debug your applications. And uh, the most relevant tools are the emulator. Um, so you don't have to upload the the application on your phone, you can use a, a, a custom emulator. Unfortunately, the emulator is typically slow, so I prefer to install the, the application on my phone. Okay, so to install the, an application on your phone, you can use uh, the Google Play Store, but this is not the case in the development, developing process. So to directly upload an application uh, on your Android phone, you have to use a USB cable and you have to enable the debug mode in the settings in the developer options of uh, your phone. So typically the developer options are hidden by default, so you have to enable them. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, this depends on the phone. So for example, in my phone, I have to tap multiple times on the build version of, of my phone. Uh, you can Google the name of your phone and search for information. Okay. So, let's start with the Android Studio and um, I think that the easiest way to, is, to run, is to run it and see what happens. So I will show you the first example we will develop. So I connect my phone to my PC. Okay. I will use an application to mirror the screen of my phone, my PC. Okay. Okay, so this is my phone. And uh, the first example we will develop is okay, advertisement. Okay. The first example we will develop is this simple calculator okay so this is a horrible design so no one in the world will use our calculator but I think that this is a good example to start with Android application so the user can insert uh, two numbers and then he can select an operation and the result is show here and if the user try to um, perform a wrong operation there is a message wrong operation and uh, we can also open uh, a new activity by clicking on this info button that will show 
some information about the creator of the app, so me. Okay? Okay. So, let's open uh, Android Studio and let's start this example from scratch. So Android Studio is very powerful, but typically is also very slow, so we have to be patient. Uh, it's quite similar to PyCharm, so the first thing to do is to decide whether to open an existing project or to start a new one. I will start a new project. Okay, here we can specify the name of the application. Let's call it Wonderful calculator it's not true but okay this is the company domain that typically is uh, uh, the website of uh, the organization for simplicity let's put ami.polito.it and this company domain is also used to generate the package base name uh, packages are actually uh, containers that can help us to organize our Java classes and we can also select uh, a project location so let's create a new folder Android on the full calculator okay okay we can click next okay here we can select the Android version, the minimum Android version of our project, okay? So, uh, we can select, for example, Android 8, but by selecting Android 8, our application uh, cannot be used on a phone with Android, uh, for example, 7. So, I will select Android 5 that cover approximately 70% uh, of devices in the world. Okay, next. And here we can select the template of our main activity. So the activity that will be associated with the top of the, of the icon. We can select the template with the Google Maps uh, um, or, uh, for example, an activity for login and so on. Uh, so I will select an empty activity and I will design it from scratch. Okay, we can specify the name of the main activity. Typically, it's better to uh, say in the name that this is the main activity. So I will leave this name. And as you can see, there are two files, two names. This is because uh, activities do have a user interface so they are composed of two different parts a java class this one that that contains the logic of the activity the java code and the layout class that is an xml file that will contains that will contain the design of the activity okay i can click finish now android studio is processing my maybe my project no doesn't work let's try again next next Next, finish. Okay. Now, Processing, processing. 
Okay. Here we are. So as you can see, it's really slow. Okay. Let me increase the font size, maybe. So Android Studio, Preferences. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, um, there are many features in uh, Android Studio. And uh, on the left side, there is the project structure, so the, the structure of your application. And inside the app folder, there are three important subfolders. The first one is the manifest that contains the manifest file of your application. So if you open it, we can say that our application is now composed of a single activity, so a single component that, have, um, that has uh, an intent filter to specify that this is uh, the main activity. Okay. Then we have the Java folder that will contain all the Java classes, so all the files that are executable. Okay. This is our base package, and inside the package there is the Java class of our main activity. Okay. So as you can see by default, the activity um, implements the onCreate method that is used to react to the event that Android sends to the activity. Uh, that means you have been created. Okay. But obviously, we can override many different uh, methods. You can look the documentation for the methods, the callback you can uh, define in an act in a activity. And then we have the resource folder, okay, that will contain all the files that are that don't include codes. So all the files that are not executable. Okay, so here we can store images, video, uh, layouts, and so on. In fact, in the layout subfolder, we have the XML file that describes the layout of our main activity. Okay, so typically um, to develop an application and in particular to design an activity you will start by defining the user by, de by designing the user interface and then you will move to the java code associated with this interface so let's start with the interface so with the xml file and the goal is to design this user interface so we have some uh, labels some input text, uh, some buttons, and so on. Uh, studio. No. Where is Android Studio? Here. No. No? I don't know what's happening. Okay. So, the first thing to do is to design the user interface um, and to place widgets, so buttons, text views, and so on, inside the screen of the phone. We have to use some uh, containers and uh, that are called containers. And we have many different types of containers. We have, for example, no, sorry, layouts, not containers. Okay, we have linear layout, horizontal, to place uh, widgets in line, or vertical, to place widgets one by line, or also a relative layout, that is not here, to place elements uh, with respect to other elements, but 
let's start with linear layout. So I will place a um, linear layout, uh, an external linear layout. So let's change, uh, sorry, we'll use, this is the XML related to our, our activity. So we can uh, design our user interface both with the preview methods so we can drag and drop components inside the, the screen of the phone or we can uh, act directly in the XML syntax so let's change this constraint layout with a linear layout okay okay so this is a linear layout and let's put the orientation of the linear layout, sorry, to vertical. So here, Android uh, orientation vertical. Okay, so now I have a linear layout, a vertical linear layout, and uh, Inside this vertical linear layout, I will put multiple horizontal linear layout to contain, for example, the, ro the button rows. Okay? So, now I drag and drop an horizontal, so I can delete this hello world text view. Okay? And I drag and drop this linear layout horizontal inside the vertical one. Okay, good. And here I can place, for example, the insert, insert number one and this text box. Okay. So I search uh, text view and I, okay, and I drag and drop it inside the horizontal linear layout. Good. So, uh, okay, this is the text view. And uh, I can specify many different parameters. And for example, mm, Okay, um, I can change the text of my label. So I can say insert number one. Okay, I can increase the font size. So no text style. Okay. Put bold and let's look for the font size. No size, text size. I can increase the size. Okay, let's put it to 18. Good. Now I can take another text view and I can put it. Here after the label, okay. Uh, it's really difficult. Uh, uh, okay, so let's try to decrease font size. Okay, so such two uh, text views are, are inside an horizontal linear layout, so they are uh, in the same line. So here, this is not a normal text view, but it's an edit text. So here, I can define this component as an edit text, okay? I can delete the text because uh, the text will be inserted by the user 
Okay, so now I look at the preview. Maybe we have to refresh. Okay, here we are. Okay. Now, uh, I have inserted the text of this edit text, uh, sorry, of this text view directly in this field. Okay, here. Now, let's suppose that uh, um, I am using many different text views in my application with the same uh, uh, string, with the same text. And now, let's suppose that I want to change this, uh, this string uh, to, I don't know, insert number without the one. I have to directly um, change all the... Um, text of all the components. So Android offers you, provides you a powerful mechanism that is you can define strings of your application inside a separate files, a separate file, and then you can uh, associate the string values to the, to the widget. So in the strings file, that is inside the value subfolders here you can specify different strings for example let's say define a string named uh, number one that is insert number one okay and then from the activity layout file I can say that the text of my widget is not R coded, but it's at string number one. Okay. So now, if I need to change the text of my widget, I can simply change it from the file. Save. Okay. And this mechanism is also important to develop multi-language applications because you can simply create a different string file for each supported language. So, for example, I can create a new value files, value resource files, file, sorry, I call it in the same way strings.xml but I can specify a locale and I can select for example not here Italy mm -mm -mm. Italian, okay, any region. Okay, now Android Studio creates uh, another stream file that is marked with the uh, Italian language, and here I can define the number one string, so I have to specify the same name, number one, okay and I can insert the, the Italian string for number one. So, inserisci numero uno. Okay? Now, if I go back on my activity, if I select the language, Okay, now the language is the default one, so English. If I change the language of my phone from my settings. Uh, okay, the application automatically changed the language to the Italian one, okay? So by specifying different strings file, you can support multiple languages, okay? Good.
let's go back what time is it okay let's go back to the English version and now I will uh, yes I will add one here and now I continue to design the interface so I will add yes I will simply copy and paste this linear layout okay oh okay I forget an important thing forgot an important thing that is we can also assign an ID to each component so that to each widget so that we can then uh, get a reference from the Java code so this text field an ID could be I don't know uh, edit number one okay and this one could be label number one good okay label number one edit number one and uh, here I can specify label number two and edit number two okay let's look at the preview uh, we have to refresh in some ways the the interface so let's change I don't know the language no no I don't know why but let's try with the phone so I can show you how to upload the application on the phone okay okay so as I already told you uh, we have to enable the developer options and the debug mode so in the developer options I have to enable this one USB debugging okay okay obviously if I okay no not upgrade sorry okay and then from Android Studio I can click run run app and here I can find uh, my device and also uh, emulators okay but now I have to click on my device I click OK and so now Android Studio is building my app and it will automatically install it in my phone it's really slow okay indexing installing okay there is a problem because there is only the first linear layout so that's okay ah okay this is because the eight of uh, the first linear layout is matching the parent component the parent uh, layout so we have to specify wrap content oh, okay here we are and we can also define a string for the second number so let's open the string file string name number two insert number two I can define it also for the Italian language number two okay and then here we can say that the text is string uh, it's number two okay good 
now we can insert the four buttons so I will take a new linear layout horizontal oh. so let's copy the linear layout here okay and inside the linear layout I will put four buttons so okay so where is the okay here this is the new linear layout and here you can insert four buttons one two three and four, as before, I have to specify the height of this linear layout to wrap the content only. Okay. Okay. And here I can <coughs> change the name, the string of the button with the four symbols. Plus, minus, times, x, and the division symbol. So here I can R code the text because it's only a character. Okay. And I can assign an ID to each button. So this is the button with ID button plus this is the button <coughs> minus this is the button times and this is the button division okay good and now I can insert the linear layout for the result uh, strings uh, below this one no sorry let's use the XML syntax it's more easier so I copy a linear layout and I put it here okay So this one also wrap content and wrap content. Okay. Okay. And inside this linear layout, I can put a label. So a text view. No, here for the result. So let's define a string for the result string name result uh, result okay risultato and okay good and here i can assign the text field to the that string result okay and then finally let's add another text view to store the result of the operation so this text view will have no content the content of this text box will be uh, replaced from from our code so text okay good now time is it okay um, we can start to develop some codes uh, some code so here 
the first thing to do is to get a reference to the widgets of our uh, user interface. So I have to define uh, some variables uh, to, let's say, model the widgets of the user interface. So I can define an edit text for the number one field, another edit text for the number two, okay, and also four references to the buttons, so button, button one, button button 2 and 3 and 4 so these are the java classes the standard java classes that uh, model uh, the widgets of uh, of a layout and we have also the text box for the result it's not text box is text view Okay, good. Now, in the onCreate method, I can get the references to the layout widgets. And I can use a standard, let's say, uh, Java function that is find view by ID. ID. So, the number one field will be find view by ID, and here I have to specify the ID I assigned to my widget. So for number one, this ID was, uh, don't remember, ID edit number one. So here I have to use a specific syntax that is R dot ID dot and my ID so edit number one okay good and then I can repeat this operation for all the other widgets so number two then we have so let's start with the button one That is button plus, and then we will. And result is dot id dot text. No, sorry. Ah, okay. I have to specify an id text result. Okay, save text dot text result okay now I can specify a callback to be executed when a user uh, tap on the button one so on the plus and to do that I have to say button one dot set on click listener okay new on click listener okay and here I can specify the code to be executed when the user tap the plus button so I can get the text of the number one and number two fields so let's say int equals to integer dot parse int number one dot get text dot to string okay and I can also get the value of the number two with the same syntax number two Oh, okay. 
I can perform the operation int res equals to and one plus and two. And the last thing to do is to uh, associate this result variable to the result text view. So result dot set text res dot no okay okay so when the user tap the plus button I define an, a listener and uh, inside the listener I get uh, the number one and the number two input inputs I perform the operation and I set the result in the result text view so let's Try it. Run. Run application. Away. Okay. Okay. So, I'm so two and six. I click plus, and <laughs> obviously <laughs> it doesn't work. So there is uh, an error. Okay. Ooh. So let's try again. Simple calculator. No, it's not this one. Wonderful calculator. Five and six plus. Okay. There is an exception. String resource ID. Resource not found. Which ID? There is a problem with uh, an ID. Button plus. Okay, I will try to fix this exception and uh, for the next time. Because we are running out of time. Uh, pa, 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 pa. No, not here. Edit number one and edit number two. This is the button plus, and this is the text result. Text result, button plus, edit number two, edit number one. Okay, I don't know where is the problem. I will try to fix you, uh, to fix the, the error, sorry. Um, so, this closed the lesson. Next time we will continue this exercise. Uh, you will also put the solution on GitHub. So, if you have any questions, I am here. Otherwise, you can go in the in LADISPE for the supervised work group. Thank you for your attention.